Hi guys, it is a hot, steamy midsummer day here in February in the sunshine state of Florida here as we're experiencing some weird record heat wave down here in Florida, but we're going to go many thousands of miles and we're going to go to what I'm hoping is cool, cloudy Vancouver, Canada, where I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with climatologist Deep T. Singh this week. And if you are not familiar with Deep T's work, I've mentioned um, some of Deep T's research in, in, in past, past videos and I thought it would be fine to bring her on a little bit about Deep T. Singh. She is an assistant professor in the School of the Environment at Washington State University in Vancouver. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University after receiving her PhD in Environmental Earth System Science from Stanford University in 2015. She is now calls herself a climate scientist motivated by the potential for climate studies to minimize future disaster risks to vulnerable communities around the world. Towards this goal, her search explores the physical drivers of climate extremes and their impacts on agriculture, water availability, and human health. She combines a variety of tools including observations, paleoclimate evidence, remote sensing data, and model simulations to study extremes in the past and more important I guess to our discussion, future climates. So Deep D saying come on and say hello to the folks and we're just going to dive right into this discussion. Um, hi everyone. I, I guess I just wanted to add a quick clarification. I'm in Vancouver, Washington, not Vancouver, Canada. Oh, did I say, man? It just that was just such a force of habit. It was right here. I I think I read it out correctly that you were uh, that you were the Vancouver in Washington, not in Canada. It's it as cool and beautiful, but. It is not in Canada. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, uh, there you go. Thank you for uh, straightening for straightening me out. It 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 is force of habit rolling off my tongue. So Deep Tea is originally from India, where she spent her the first twenty three years of her life. And I hope towards the end of this discussion, we might have a few minutes to talk about just how her vision of India and how it's going to play out as a player on the global stage as the 21st century develops. But first, let's dive into what, uh, let's dive in to the future disaster risks here on Collapse Chronicles. And where can we start? Deep, the obviously, I'm assuming heat waves and droughts are, are probably on your radar. Just give us give, give us your assessment. Just dive right into it. What you think we need to know about extreme weather events and what we need to know to help prepare for them in our own lives. Sure. Um, so heat waves are actually the, the strongest signal that we have of climate change um, and the most uh, confident impact that we know of in the future because our temperature distributions are shifting. We're getting warmer weather. The earth is warming up and that means we're going to get more heat waves. Um, we have already seen some pretty dramatic impacts of these heat waves. Since you mentioned I was from India um, in 2015, um, uh, there was a record heat wave in in parts of May and June, when um, you've probably seen this really iconic image of the road, the crosswalk melting. Yes, I do. Um, and um, over a thousand people died 
because of those extreme heat conditions there. Uh, and India is not the only place that's experiencing these uh, conditions. Pretty much um, everywhere around the world, we've seen uh, uh, temperatures warming up. We've seen an increase in the frequency and the intensity of heat waves. Um, and this is an issue because our, our, our bodies have a physical limit to the amount of um, heat we can withstand. And it's especially a concern for for people that don't have the ability to cope with such um, conditions. So for example, in India, we have uh, um, a large population there is homeless. They don't have access to air conditioning or um, structures, cooling structures, um, which makes them extremely vulnerable to such conditions. Yeah, well, I, I, as I say, sitting here in, in February in the 90 degree heat in, in Florida, I can, you know, everything you're saying is, is hitting home literally in, in my own life right now. And so what, what is your vision? I mean, we, we hear this, this all the time. I, I, th this faster than previously thought, are you... Are, are you noticing this in, or in your own research? Are you one of these climatologists who is sitting here with her jaw open about how, how fast all of this seems to be speeding up? Or, is, or could you have predicted this yourself uh, over the past few years, how, how so many records are falling? Well, I think this is not unexpected. The, the fact that we are seeing surprises, that we're seeing record um, temperatures and record low precipitation being exceeded every year in some place or the other, that is not unexpected given what we know about how the Earth system responds to um, increasing greenhouse gases. Um, but to me, what worries me the most as I am currently teaching a class on the science and policy of climate change um, I, what worries me most is the research that's coming out of, uh, you know, different institutions where they talk about how methane uh, from permafrost is melting at a faster rate than we thought, and the fact that um, Arctic um, uh, glaciers in, in Antarctica are melting, the ice losses uh, quadrupled in the last 50 years. Um, places that we thought were extremely stable in Antarctica are losing ice, which, are, which is contributing to sea level rise. I think those are the things that concern me. Um, and this is, this is just new news in the last two months. So we're starting to see things um, that are likely to, to accelerate climate change because those are things that we have not accounted for. So are you working on, on any per particular area of research uh, at, at the moment that you're trying, trying to develop? Yes, I am um, currently working on, a lot of my work is focused around South Asia. Uh, I'm studying the monsoons uh, there and how different anthropogenic activities influence the monsoon. And so often we talk about greenhouse gases, but in South Asia, uh, there are a couple of other things we need to worry about. Um, so the first one is anthropogenic aerosols, which are basically uh, particles uh, of sulfate or black carbon that are released from fossil fuel burning and from biomass burning. And these, um, the concentration is extremely high in South and East Asia. They're the, amongst the highest um, anywhere in the world. And a lot of literature over the last couple of decades has shown that these aerosols have actually weakened the monsoon and they've changed different characteristics of the monsoon. The other factor that we, um, that is gaining some traction is the the importance of agriculture. So agriculture causes land use change. And so changes in the land cover from we're replacing forests with crops that 
process changes um, interactions between the land and the atmosphere. But in addition to that, the agricultural intensification that's happened associated with the Green Revolution, where we've had um, a really uh, large increase in grain production, and that's largely been associated with irrigated areas. So the irrigation um, in South Asia, again, is amongst the highest in the world. It's about three to five times higher um, than any other part of the world. And so these factors, all these three factors, which are associated with different human activities, um, are occurring over South Asia. And that that has led to a lot of uncertainty in what is causing the changes that we see over South Asia. And so my work is trying to understand um, how these different factors influence the monsoon, um, which of these has had the largest contribution to the changes that we have seen over the last few decades, and then how are we going to expect these these factors to change in the future and influence climate in the near term there. Um, and so I'm trying to understand, this basically use a combination of models and observations to um, address these questions. Wow, that, that, was, that was quite a mouthful, DT. I could just... I, I, I could take any one of those and easily turn this in, into uh, to an hour of, uh, uh, of discussion. So can, can, can I just pick a couple of things that you have mentioned in, in, in the last 10 minutes or, 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 or would you like to center on a couple that you really uh, think need to be talked about? I I'll say one thing, and then you and okay. then you feel free to pick a, a thread. The one thing I want to say about it is that climate, agriculture, and human health are are sorry. Climate, agriculture, and pollution are tied pretty closely together, and we need to understand this coupled system if we want to understand the effect of human activities on human health, because each of those things influences human health. Climate directly affects human health. Agriculture affects human health through nutrition and food availability. And pollution affects human health directly through bad air quality. And so it's a complicated system, and there's a lot we don't know about it, but we know that these interactions are bad for the people, for the billions of people that live there. To, to, he has to put it mildly. Uh, looking, look at looking forward to, you know, I, as I said, I want to I want to talk about India in particular, but a, a little later on. Uh, when you mentioned the aerosols, where I thought you were going with this, now I had not I had not even considered the implications of the uh, of the monsoons. Are you, in your study, have you ever come across this whole, not even a theory, I guess it's, it's pretty cut and pretty well understood, the, the whole phenomenon of global dimming that actually uh, this, this coal burning and, and various other aerosol pollution is actually geoengineering accidentally and, and keeping the the extreme temperatures actually moderated and if they do in fact if India and China declare war on on that pollution that the flip side is that the heat waves could actually get even more extreme and it's a real double-edged sword. What, what is your view on all of that research and conclusions? So if, I, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that uh, if India and China commit to reducing um, these aerosols by implementing clean coal technologies, that would reduce the production of sulfate, which is basically what we talk about when we, t when yeah. we think about anthropogenic aerosols. Those are the aerosols that, that cause the dimming effect and the cooling effect. Um, that we will see an unmasking of the, their effect on, on, on global 
and regional climate. And that's true because in parts of Asia, uh, both South and East Asia, we have seen a masking of the effect of greenhouse gases. The warming effect of greenhouse gases has been masked by um, these anthropogenic aerosols that exist over the region. And so, yes, it would lead to um, and uh, probably a, an emergence of extreme heat at a faster rate than we have seen so far. Um, but it also means that those pollutants are bad for human health. So, so what's the what what's the choice? It sounds like we're we we, we gotta have a Sophie's choice here as, as a a global industrial society. See what I'm saying? Uh, which, which which side do we err on? Um, I think. I'm, I'm so I'm not a, 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 a management person, so I don't have to deal with these issues. But I would imagine that it's easier to to deal with and and reduce the vulnerability of people to extreme heat than it is to deal with the illnesses that people experience because of their exposure to pollutants. So the health risks from pollutants, I think, are higher than the effect. Of extreme heat, we that is something we will experience. But um, through uh, effective management of resources that can be mitigated, the impacts of extreme heat can be mitigated. Um, I think air pollution and the the health risks from that are a larger concern, and that should be a priority when we think about what to do with aerosols. So you mentioned the aerosols effects on the monsoons. Can you give us a, an oversimplified layman's summation of, of what are, uh, are, are they, do they cause more rain or less rain? Yeah, I would think they would cause more. So you bring up an interesting and really complicated issue that is not completely resolved in the community. Um, so aerosols can cause both an increase and a decrease in rainfall. But I'm going to, I guess I'll talk specifically about the effect it's having on the South Asian monsoon. The clearest impact of the aerosols that we see um, is a decline in monsoon precipitation over, over land because um, of the cooling effect that um, these aerosol particles have. Oh, up oh, so it ties so, back into what I was just saying. So we, we have seen an overall decline in precipitation, um, and we've seen an earlier onset of the monsoon. So it's changed the timing of the, mon sum the summer monsoon, uh, and it's caused basically an um, earlier onset as well as more rainfall earlier in the season. Um, it has also contributed to extreme precipitation in, in certain ways. Um, and so aerosols are really not that easy to, the, the impact of aerosols is not that easy to envision because they're not a uniform forcing like greenhouse gases yeah, are. Yeah. So they're not, they're not, they're not, their distribution is not homogenous. And because of that, they have caused a change in the, in the distribution of rainfall. There's certain parts that experience an increase in rainfall associated with it, and there's certain parts that experience a decrease in rainfall because of aerosols. So it's shifted the pattern of rainfall, and it's caused extreme heavy precipitation. It's, it's caused an increase in extreme heavy precipitation in parts of in the northern parts of South Asia, whereas over the central part, where it's supposed to be the heaviest, um, it's caused a decline in precipitation there. Wow, I, I I can see that. I, I I just don't know how you even begin to disentangle all of these various balls of string, kind of. And the more you talk, the 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 more I see these these dot connections is going off in every possible direction. It's. How, how how you climatologists manage how you manage to isolate one thing without getting without going down a whole bunch of other rabbit holes. But since I have the freedom here to go down other rabbit holes, I want to talk about uh, the Green Revolution, 
and particularly as you were saying the dependence upon irrigation that that so much of the 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 green revolution which kind of staved off you know some of the biggest fears you know going back good lord to you know to the 1960s uh, ha have we gotten everything we're going to get out of the Green Revolution? I mean, what, what more can we do with it? Are, are we hitting the point of diminishing returns? Or are we going to be able to, as they say, where I come, squeeze some more blood out of this turnip? Well, there is definitely scope to increase production of greens. There are different ways to do it. Um, irrigation, although I say that, um, you know, there are parts of India where, or, or South Asia that um, are heavily irrigated, there are also a lot of places in South Asia, a lot of farmers that don't have access to irrigation. And this is also the case in other parts of the world. So there's definitely, um, you know, without expanding the area under agriculture, there are methods to intensify agriculture and that's going to be required to meet the, the needs of the growing population. I've, I've, um, I've heard from other people that we need to increase our food production by about 50% by um, 2050 to meet um, you know, the, the needs of the two billion, additional 2 billion people that are going to be on this, expected to be on this planet by then, um, and that's going to require an in intensification of agriculture. Do you what think that's gonna, do you, do you think that's gonna happen, or, or are you optimistic that we are going to, to be able to rise to that challenge, or do you see a, a bottleneck forming and, and, and things not living up to some people's expectations? I believe with technology, we will be able to increase food production. I don't believe that we're going to solve food insecurity because food supply and food production is only one aspect of food security. And by that, I mean that there are still a lot of people in this world that don't have sufficient resources to purchase food nutritious food. The, the agricultural system is not optimized um, to provide nutritious food and it's not optimized to make the best um, use of our natural resources. So I've been working with some people at Columbia University to look at how the, the distribution of grains um, in, in India um, relate to the use of land, the, both land as well as water resources there. And with the Green Revolution in India, we had a, a rapid increase in uh, production of rice and wheat. So the entire Indo-Gangetic Basin in India is predominantly growing rice and wheat. Rice in the summertime and wheat in the wintertime. That requires and an, a really large amount of water. And uh, as we know, as we've heard, glaciers are melting. That's something we understand is going to happen with um, rising greenhouse gas emissions. That's going to change the availability of water for irrigation. And so, uh, and, and, and also in, in the process of producing you know, rice and, and wheat in this area, they've also, people, the farmers have been tapping into the groundwater resources, which have been depleting and, and haven't been recharged at the rate at which they are being depleted um, because of the changing monsoons. So I think that um, it's, go, it's certainly going to be a problem in, in terms of how we're going to manage um, the production of, of these grains and they can certainly be optimized. Uh, there can be different grains that should be grown in these areas to that are, that are more suitable for the climate in these areas. We shouldn't be growing grains that need so much um, excess water. It should be rice and, mainly you're talking about. 
Yeah, and rice is also not the most nutritious grain in terms of um, so some of our re some of our earlier research uh, from within the last couple of years has shown that there are um, other cereals like millets that that are that are more nutritious that are less sensitive to climate variability and require and that are more efficient at at um, using our our land as well and so those make more sense to grow and they will provide better nutrition to the population there which already is suffering from um, poor nutrition from their food resources. So the, so the irrigation situation, at least in India, it sounds like all three that the, the glaciers, the groundwater and the monsoons are from from all three sides that uh, we're, we're, we're ha having problems uh, forming and it's not just India I mean you, you can take India as, as a poster child and, and probably find similar stories unfolding and you know all over the planet but it sounds Absolutely. like in, it sounds like India is uh, is experiencing the the triple whammy India, Pakistan, yes, the South Asia, I would broadly say South Asia is where these issues are the most acute. Yeah, and uh, but, but before we started recording, I, uh, th th this, th this is probably out of the purview of, of this conversation, but I, I guess that India and Pakistan are now uh, ma making noise about getting in some sort of water war that India has now threatened to cut off the flow of three major rivers flowing in into Pakistan. So now we, we have a, a military uh, dot to uh, con to connect to all this. I, I don't know if you in, in, in your research ever ever get into that or not? Do you have any any comment to make on that? On uh, the geopolitical tensions that in, involving water and climate between India and Pakistan? So um, India, India has this issue with not just with Pakistan but it also has the issue with with China because it, we um, there's the um, Brahmaputra River which crosses the boundary with China as well. Uh, and there's the Indus River that crosses the boundary between India and Pakistan. Uh, both of these are extremely important for food production, freshwater availability, and hydroelectricity production in these areas. So change it, what one country does in terms of building dams or, or diverting uh, water from these to, towards irrigation or um, other rivers is going to have a, um, is going to lead to conflict. I believe that water uh, scarcity is going to be an issue, not just in South Asia. Uh, we know that it's an issue in parts of Africa as well. Uh, so it is going to cause conflict. Water is one of the most vital resources that we need um, for everything that we do, and. Um, change that is going to cause a conflict there. India and Pakistan already have high tensions for several reasons and um, changing the, the one of the most critical resources is going to intensify that conflict, no doubt. I have no doubt that that's going to happen. It's threatening um, food production. The Indus River is one of the main sources of irrigation water for food production in, in Pakistan. Pakistan's a dry part of the world and um, they need that water to produce the food to feed their population. So if India were to make good on its threats, I mean that literally, I mean as t today, yeah, you, well, in, the, in the past 24 hours the, the rhetoric is, is, is ramping up. So if India were to make good on its threats about diverting it, it was the Indus and two others, uh, two other rivers all together that flow into Kashmir and on into, uh, into Pakistan. I mean, it really would be a, a serious issue for Pakistanis. I mean, they are depending on that water. Absolutely. 
and I, I don't think uh, this is a place for us to talk about. Yeah, that. yeah. As I, but let's talk about the, the bigger picture. As I was thinking when, when I was reading this, uh, the, these articles, it just just today, just a few hours ago, I was reading. Uh, uh, I, was, I was reading several of these articles about this issue, and not one of them in the article, I'm saying maybe I misunderstand it, but I'm thinking, aren't all of these rivers, including the Indus, aren't they pretty much glacial meltwater rivers? And in, in, in another 30 or 40 years, it doesn't matter who's diverting water from whom because there will be no water left in any of these river systems. Where where are we with the uh, with with the glacial melt uh, in in the Himalayas right now? And in, in your opinion, and how bad is this going to get? And what's it going to look like literally on the ground in in Asia as these glaciers disappear? Yeah. Um, so we haven't we haven't seen a decline in glaciers uniformly across Asia. There are definitely places where um, there has been an increase in the size of glaciers, and there have definitely been places where it's been declining. Uh, the glaciers have been declining pretty rapidly. Like um, in Central Asia, for example, um, there are glaciers that where people have observed a decline in the, in the extent as well as uh, the size of glaciers. Um, the river, river flow, um, so the flow in these rivers is associated both with glacial melt as well as with, um, you know, rainfall. So monsoonal rains can contribute to part of the uh, to part of the the flow in these rivers. And so, um, when exactly we'll see a decline in river flow from a combination of glacial melt and changes in the monsoon? That's hard to predict. Uh, but I would say that eventually the effect of melting, uh, melting and receding glaciers um, are likely to aggravate the, uh, the issue of uh, water, water availability in these areas. Um, the, you know, because there's some uncertainty in how the monsoons are going to change, and as I mentioned, some of these complexities in terms of what, what um, these different anthropogenic um, activities, uh, how they're going to influence the monsoon in, in the coming years. I think there can be, um, I can see a scenario where in the next 20 to 30 years, we may not see a dramatic decline in, in glaciers in South Asia um, because certain parts of the Himalayas are gaining snow. Um, but eventually the effect of, well, you know, by the end of the 21st century, this is going to be an, an issue and it's going to cause water scarcity in the region. I think that combined with the increased demand on our, on our water resources because of the rising population in these areas is, is, is going to lead to acute water, secure, water um, scarcity and conflict. Uh, are, are you willing to... Uh to go down the the O road here for a moment about as, as, as long as I'm talking to somebody from from India and you mentioned the population pressures now as I understand it that India is going to become I think they're saying when in in about five years that India is going to surpass China to being the most populated country on the planet uh, and, and I, I personally th this is just my perspective deep tea and, and you can correct me if you think my perspective is wrong I don't feel like that I am hearing f from anyone in India the government or otherwise that they are taking j the, the overpopulation uh, challenge Seriously enough, I mean, how? What? Just run with that uh, a, a minute. What are your feelings on the just the pure population pressures? With everything you've been talking about for the past thirty minutes, I'm, I'm hearing the the worst thing that we can be doing is bringing more and more consumers of water and food and energy into the mix. 
Well, as a, a scientist, we don't often get to talk about our feelings, but we're talking about a part of the world that um, I think a lot about, and I've, because I've lived there, and that's really been the motivation for me to to get into this field. I will um, talk about that. Population is it, a complex issue. Um, population, the the pressures that a rising population puts on environmental resources. Um, is is undoubtedly a problem in terms of the global warming issue. Um, I don't think the population of South Asia is is the problem because the carbon footprint of a person that lives there is is much lower than the carbon put, footprint of somebody that lives in the U.S. Um, or in Europe, for that matter, or from or any mm-hmm. of the developed countries. Most of the people there live on um, very basic and meager resources. Um, but in terms of so, in terms of like the global rise in greenhouse gases that cause climate change, I don't think the population in these areas or uh, the population in the developing countries are contributing that much to it. We know when we hear about this, we talk about this a lot, that it's the most vulnerable people, yeah. people that have not contributed to this problem, um, that are going to experience the largest effects of increasing greenhouse gases on our climate system. But the pressure that the rising population puts on it, from having spent a lot of time there, um, I I've, well, so one, you have to meet the the... Uh, demand for energy and food and water of these people. And that's not something that that our society is e- equipped to do. We're, there are obviously a lot of people there that are uh, experiencing food insecurity. Uh, a lot of people there don't have access to energy. Uh, a lot of people there don't have access to water, clean water. And those are all issues that we have to think about, um, and I honestly I don't know what the right answer is, but it's it's a complicated. I think it's just a complicated issue, and I think pollution pollution of our natural resources uh, because of the rising population is a concern to me. Water pollution, land pollution, um, is is a huge concern to me. And I, as I as I, I spent a lot of time um, talking with farmers and visiting villages and talking to small scale farmers uh, to understand how they respond to climate change. And as as a, um, and while doing that, I you know I see the kind of pollution that is being spread throughout these places, and that is what worries me the most. Energy is something that you know India has been investing quite a bit in in clean energy, even when I lived there about 10 years ago, um, I in a, in a lot of villages, because they don't have access to fossil fuel associated electricity, they, they've been, grow, they've been uh, developing both, investing in both solar energy as well as wind energy to provide access to people that live in remote areas, to provide energy access. Um, but, it, you know, that, so, so if we do that, you know, even even renewable energies, um, you know, trying to get them access to that is is, is is a priority. But I think for me, the what I worry about most, and what I'm what I'm concerned about most, is the pollution that's associated with activities associated with the one billion people that live there. Yeah, well, I I think, and I I mean, I I don't have my notes in front of me. It says I I try to keep track of so many uh, different statistics, but I think I remember reading recently when you're talking about that the CO2 emissions reached an all-time high in 2018, more than any year in, in, in history that India was leading the pack, that in 2018, 8% increase in carbon emissions in India was, was the number one worst record on the entire planet it has more and more well we got more and more people and then uh, m- more and more people get you know getting out of poverty which is you know on one hand certainly a good thing but you have in 2018 you have an, an eight percent increase in carbon emissions and then I'm sure you've read these uh, th- these horror stories about the just the air conditioning forecast 
for the country of India when you add in the, the just the number of air conditioning consumers and the number of people in India able to afford air conditioners as the these heat waves uh, and, and droughts and whatnot increase and see you know try trying to figure out where that's going so so go with that a little bit and talk about the you know India's fossil fuel carbon emission increase last year and the uh, and, and just the forecast looking ahead from something as simple as air conditioning and where do you see all this leading so I have to be honest I don't know that number I haven't read that number um, but there is it so there isn't you know India and China are both contributing significantly to carbon pollution but I have two things to say about that, okay. um, so bear with me. The first is that if we actually think about where that uh, carbon is being consumed, so if we think about the carbon associated with all the products that are consumed in the developed world, even though they're produced in India and China, um, if we, you know, it's called consumption-based accounting, if we do that, the developed world is still a predominant contributor to carbon pollution. The second thing that I want to say about that is the, the size of the population there isn't, I think I mentioned this earlier in our conversation, isn't contributing that substantially to carbon pollution. Most people there uh, their their carbon footprint is 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 like an order, a couple of orders of magnitude yeah. lower than the than the carbon footprint of people in the developed world. Um, however, uh, India India and China are both making uh, strides, and they they they're they're making strides towards um, having a significant portion, something like thirty to forty percent of their energy production from renewable resources. In their target is to do that by 2030s, and they're investing heavily. In, uh, India, as I'm pretty sure, is investing heavily in solar energy resources. They already have a few big plants in the northwest, um, and that production is expected to increase um, by 2030. And it's one of um, they're investing in it and they're producing more energy from renewable resources. And I also believe I've read that about uh, that India is uh, the fourth largest wind power producer in the world. And so they are using alternative energies to meet the energy demands of their population. So you sound fairly, compared to a lot of people, you can imagine uh, the, the disparate uh, number of people I, I talk to from all ends of the spectrum down here in this rabbit hole. That's why, I, that's why I enjoy doing this so much, is just hearing all different viewpoints. But I, I, it doesn't sound like you would consider yourself a, a catastrophist or a collapsitarian so your your view of it, it sounds like I don't want to put words in your mouth but what I'm hearing from you is that you that you think the worst catastrophes and disasters can be averted through uh, technology and ingenuity is that safe to say or Yes, I do not consider myself a collapsitarian for sure. Um, I am actually pretty optimistic um, because I think more and more people around the world are recognizing the issue of uh, climate change and the severity of this issue. And I think a lot can be done in terms of managing the impacts of these resources. So with with climate science with the advances that we're making in our field, uh, both in climate science as well as in weather predictions, we are uh, able to predict and forecast a lot of um, extreme weather events in, in you know, with, with sufficient advance, like uh, for hurricanes, for example, we're able to make predictions um, almost a week in advance and managing the occurrence of those 
extreme events um, is, is what's going to help us minimize the, their impact. So just better management is going to minimize some of the, the impacts that we are likely to experience with extreme, um, uh, extreme weather events. But I also think technology will help us. Technology and management will also help us reduce the problem. Okay, so when you mention uh, in your in your first sentence describing yourself, I am a climate scientist motivated by the potential for climate studies to minimize future disaster risk. So that that's what you're you, that's what you're dedicating your life to, obviously. So what what would you say? Good Lord, we are all. How are we? I feel like we've been talking for 10 minutes. I'm looking at the clock. We've been at this for 45 minutes and need to wrap up. So I probably should have asked this this a lot earlier, but we, we started running down these other rabbit holes. What do you see as the main future disasters that you're trying to uh, that, that you're trying to minimize that that we need to what are the future disaster risks that we need to be paying the most attention to as a global industrial society so disasters are a combination of extreme events and exposed populations right so a disaster is only a disaster when an extreme event occurs in a place where there are a lot of people that are vulnerable to weather variability. Does that make sense? That does. Yes. And so for me, um, the the biggest concern is the, the, the food and water availability in parts of the world that are extremely vulnerable. And that is what I dedicate my life to, is making sure that we, we are able to quantify the impacts of a changing climate, as well as quantify the changes that we're expected, we're, we're uh, likely to experience um, within the next few decades, which can help people um, and inform management um, of these resources. And so, um, yeah, I, I try to focus my uh, my research efforts on parts of the world that are most vulnerable um, in trying to help them understand how climate is going to change and what those changes, uh, what the impacts of those changes are going to be on food and water. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious, you're living, you, you chose a, a cool, a, well, comparatively, certainly from my uh, childhood in India, what was your decision to move to the Pacific Northwest? Uh, did that have anything to do with uh, w with the climate? And are you planning to to live out the rest of your days in in the Pacific Northwest, or do you have plans to return to India uh, sometime in your future? Well, I do research in in India, and I. I spend time there while I do my some of my research. Um, I am in the Pacific Northwest because I got an awesome job at the Wash at Washington State University. I think um, for me, I enjoy teaching, and I think that training future scientists and future um, policymakers and future engineers is um, is going to help um, manage the problem of climate change and. Um, Climate change and pollution, and I, and I, it's a. I think it's a. It's a large part of that, and I wanted, I wanted to to be able to do that, and that's what I'm doing here. So I hope to continue. I'm on tenure track, so I don't know as long as I keep doing what I'm doing. I guess um, I should be able to stay here, and so I, my my future, my near term future plans are to continue um, to work here, both in education as well as in doing research in this area. Okay, and I, I, I just can't, my, my little dog Sancho Panza is saying, I, I, I have got to ask you, this has nothing to do with, uh, I don't think, with, with your academic work. My little dog is not a fan of pit bulls, but you are. Just, just give us a, 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 a two minute, I, I'm just curious how someone, you, you, you normally, 
When you think of pit bulls, uh, you don't think of someone like you being their owners. How did you develop your love affair with pit bulls? And, and give pit bulls some good press here on Collapse Chronicles before we say goodbye. Well, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about that because <laughs> that's an issue that's extremely uh, dear to me. I um, spent a lot of time with the animal rescue shelters in New York and um, their pit bulls are um, the most common uh, breed that you will see in these shelters. They're also the most misunderstood dogs. They are also the mi most mistreated animals um, in in places where they have such a bad reputation. They are amazing dogs. They're like any other dog you will meet. The ones that are aggressive are ones that have been trained to be that way uh, by humans. Not They are not inherently any different from from other dogs. I um, have volunteered with a lot of them. I've found good homes for a lot of them. Um, it's a matter of, you know, as a, as a, similarly with climate change, it's a matter of management. Um, they have high energy. How do you manage that? Um, you don't put them in a place where they are going to uh, be around people that don't, um, you know, jive with their energy. But they are amazing dogs. They, um, I take my dog to to campus some days, and she gets to meet a lot of people there, and brings a lot of um, happiness and joy to the students there. Um, she also interacts with children, even though she was scared of them earlier. But now she's gotten to the point where she's um, pretty comfortable about around humans, dogs, and and every everything else around. Uh, and that's the case with most pit bulls. They, you know, they are they can be amazing dogs to have, um, and they they're not dangerous unless they've been mistreated. And even if they have been mistreated. Um, through affection and care and patience, they can be, um, they, they can, they forgive and then their true personalities come out. Okay, well we have some positive press about, uh, about pit bulls. I, I am a dog lover, I, I admit so uh, deeply that, that, that I, I know I, several pit bulls in my own life who I love dearly and are absolute sweethearts, but I still don't let my little ten pound dog. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just don't let Sancho, my little ten pound, you know, one, one snap of those jaws, and uh, I don't know. So I probably uh, a, a little. He, he, I would probably let him around your dog, okay? Who I assume is a spayed female, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I fostered three Chihuahuas at one time in a tiny New York apartment and it went really well. <laughs> With the pit bull you mean? With, uh, I had one pit bull and I was fostering three chihuahuas. With, with your spayed female pit bull? Yes. Okay, well as I say, uh, if we ever meet I will make an exception. If you're, anyway, we, <laughs> good lord, this, this camera is going to turn off in about five minutes and I Really appreciate you coming out here and spending some time. Stick around after I, I say goodbye, but I want to wrap up this interview as I do with all of my guests here. And that is this way. So, Deep T Singh, if you are not talking to Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles, but actually have the mainstream media uh, sticking a microphone in your face and saying, you have 60 seconds to send the deep tea sing message out to the planet in the early days of 2019, what would that message to the world sound like? So um, I, I would say that climate change is an issue that we are dealing with right now. It's not an issue for the future. It's an issue that's affecting people. Uh, around the world, it's affecting not just um, people in in India and in China and Africa. It's affecting people in the U.S. and in Europe. It's costing billions of dollars to manage the impacts of, of climate change, and it is an economically and ethically the right choice to make to try to address um, climate change right now. Okay.
Okay, and for those who want to find out, to hear more from Deepti about her, her research, her papers, and whatnot, it looks like you have a blog post, and I'm going to, you, I, I, is that that deepti's 47githubio that is your, your, your website, right? It is, yes. Okay, I don't. I'm, blog yet but I uh, that's my website and I'm also on Twitter as climate chirper the climate chirper okay yes. Cli climate chirper I've never I've never heard of that uh, that expression but I like it okay so I will put the link to deep D's website and invite people to go on that to find out more and as I say hang around here so we can talk for a minute but deep D sing we do really appreciate you taking time out on Saturday afternoon to uh, take an hour out of your busy schedule to come speak with us at Collapse Chronicles. And we appreciate what you are doing out there and keep up the good fight. Thank you. Bye, guys.